These photographers um, also reject works that had clear political or social motivation. So the Provoke era photographers are political, but they don't want to wear that on their sleeve. They don't want to make it clear to you what their politics are. Okay? Um, and so they're not interested in what we might call kind of an FSA, um, documentary 30s style, what we associate with the FSA. So if you think Dorothea Lange, um, migrant, or migrant mother, which is the kind of canonical, iconic figure, um, especially for California, um, if you think of those kind of photographs, um, there's sort of a version being done um, in the 1950s by this artist who I'm reducing to great simplicity here for the purpose of the talk, um, Ken Doman. From, this is slide number 22. Um, he uh, championed approach in which he championed an approach um, in which the subject matter is documented in a straightforward manner, and that's of course again relative. But um, he was also sympathetic with his subjects, right? Trying to kind of uh, empathize with them in the same way that Dorothea Lange, given that I think empathizing with your subject with the photograph with the photographic project is a complicated uh, endeavor in itself. Now, provoke your Photographers rejected this um, approach in part because they felt that um, the documentary of the documentary style of the 50s focused too much on marginal aspects of society. Um, children, those who were not mainstream, um, I think also because it didn't focus on themselves, but that might be my own imagination. Um, and then also uh, they called it, it was called, uh, not these examples, but similar, it's called beggar photography. Um, I think, though, ultimately what they didn't like was it didn't force you to think. Okay? This is the kind of documentation that you can look at, appreciate, and move on, and not have any of your categories of knowledge or ways of thinking challenged. That is what these photographers wanted. They wanted to challenge us. So when you go into this show, which, of course, I haven't seen, it's like the Jill's hired me to do the weirdest project imaginable, which is talk about a show that I have not curated or organized or seen. But, but nonetheless, as we imagine ourselves going into this show, one thing that I think is really key to getting at it is this idea that what we're going to see is supposed to challenge us. It is not supposed to fit into those known categories that we expect of photography, whether that's a stylistic category, subject matter, execution, what have you. Okay, so at this point, and I'm here on slide 23 with the collage of multiple images, I have, I didn't make a text slide for this, but I'll walk you, I'll, I'll list these slowly, but I have six issues that I think are relevant to sort of an analysis of these photographs. Now these six issues can be, they're sort of in, some, some are more applicable to other, to certain images and less applicable to other images. So you, you pick and choose as you see fit. So they are one choice of subject matter. So choice of subject matter is going to be something to consider when we're looking at them. Okay. Secondly, and obviously choice of subject matter, but we're thinking here, what, what do we make of the subject matter? And these are hard. These are not the best. Lead. I would not say I phrased these very um, effectively, but I couldn't come up with anything better. Okay. Second one would be ambiguity of genre, right? So is it a landscape? Is it a portrait? What is this thing? Okay, ambiguity of genre, and then I have like a dash, hybridity. Okay. When I think these artists are interested in hybridizing, okay, which is to make things that are part this, part that, somewhere in the middle, don't really know where. Okay, the third thing, which is fairly straightforward, which actually the show description prioritizes, is an anti-aesthetic qualities, this blurred, um, rough, and out of focus sensibility. Fourth, I guess I have five issues, sorry. The fourth is conceptual, okay? We call this conceptual, you almost call this conceptual art, but not quite. I think it's idea-based, okay? Rather than look at something and go, oh, that looks pretty, you're supposed to go, oh, what's the ideas here? Is there some idea I'm working with, the artist working with, okay? And then the fifth is a denial of the artist's touch, or a denial of the sense that we can read the photograph as a clear, indication of the artist's self-expression. In many ways, the artists are going to evacuate themselves out of it. We're going to be like, the photographer actually made this? And by evacuating themselves, they sort of take themselves out of the equation as a source of meaning. And as a result, we then are forced to deal with what we see 
on the terms that we see it, rather than going, well, the artist meant this. Okay, so again, choice of subject matter, ambiguity of genre, anti-aesthetic, conceptual or idea-based, and then denial of the artist's touch. Okay, they blend into each other, so the following analysis of individual photographs is gonna be kind of fuzzy, but that's good. Um, okay, so core, another core idea, kind of overarching idea here, and I've already said this, actually. Um, keep in mind that the best of these images were designed to intentionally destabilize preconceived ideas. So they're intentionally destabilizing. They weren't meant to escape easy categorization. And in reading through um, kind of background material for this, one thing that stands out for me was that they, they, they wanted images that ultimately escaped the clutches of language. They didn't want something that could be easily described. If you couldn't necessarily describe it, that meant that you could have this ongoing sort of dialogue with it because the words you came up with seemed inadequate to it actually closing down the meaning. And that lack of closure was a way to get at, if you will, the lack of closure that is actually characteristic of life until you have the final closure, okay? That this kind of ongoing ambiguous nature of it. Okay, so that is the, that's the, that's the, the the context. So let's take a few, look at some, uh, some examples here, and I'm gonna walk us through uh, my kind of observations. Um, these observations I offer here are by no means explicitly the final word. So um, the other thing is I should say is that I have not used much by way of the artist statements. I, Jill, I think you said that that the documents that you will be getting are uh, include a lot of artist statements. So my goal here has been to sort of give you the kind of big framework that then you can take the individual artist statements and apply them as you see fit within this. And, and much of this writing from this period is deliberately sort of, I guess, philosophical almost, okay? It's a sort of philosophical meditation on what their project is. Now, if their project is to make images that aren't closed down by language, I don't think we should expect them to be explaining what their images are about. Okay, there should be a deliberate kind of vagueness over here and an uncertainty over here, and voila, we have a great work of art, right? So that is their approach. So, like, when you read those statements, keep that in mind. I think it'll help explain. Like, you go, oh, this is a really good phrase. Perfect, that's what you need. You don't need the whole apparatus, okay? All right, so here I'm showing you um, uh, Yataka uh, Takanashi um, from a series Tokyo Jin. Uh, which translates as People of Tokyo. Now, originally, this was a 36-page spread um, in a photo magazine comprised of 43 photographs. So that we're seeing these in the wall as separate um, photographs, separately printed photographs, is interesting. And just as an aside, you might note that that is the power of the art market right there. Right? That it has taken something that was deliberately intended not to be marketized, not to be commoditized, and here has become precious and in the, value, in the context of the museum. Okay, so what we see here is um, uh, an, ob an artist choosing ordinary and mundane uh, people for his subject. This is not um, any uh, individuals who are by name you know, worthy of consideration other than they're sort of a randomly chosen selection here at a, a train station. Um, also, I would say here, notice the way in which the photograph has been framed or shot. Seems shot down low, kind of randomly, almost surreptitiously, okay? As if the photographer has not looked up at the camera, but held it down low and just kind of shot from the hip, okay? That shot from the hip sense, I think, is an, a way to displace the idea that the photographer stood there and actually photo photographed it and posed it. And in so, the individuals there, if the photographer is shooting from the hip, you can imagine that the individuals there don't know someone's shooting and therefore are more authentic, if you will, rather than working, you know, going like, oh, there's someone's photographing, I don't want them photographing me, or, you know, I better stand up straight so I don't look um, poorly for whoever is taking this. Um, so the composition has this random quality to it, it seems not composed, and it's not particularly flattering. And compositionally too, it's kind of, it's a cool composition, right, for its cropping, um, and, but it also has this kind of strange void in the middle that allows us to enter into it, a kind of chaoticness to it. 
um, not at all anything in the kind of Adams kind of modernist tradition or even a kind of pictorial tradition or even kind of somewhat documentary though. So you, I think we could fit that to that. Um, we could say that these choices have a somewhat political edge in that this artist is embracing a more egalitarian approach for art, that art is going to represent the people rather than the special people or the special places. Here I show you um, uh, Yoshiyuki. This is a, most of these works are untitled, but again from a series called The Park. Um, for this series, um, the artist documented people who gathered in Tokyo parks at night for romantic rendezvous. Those would be um, heterosexual as well as homosexual. Um, there were spectators who lurked in the bushes, um, sometimes to watch, sometimes to participate. Um, so again, this is a 60, total of 60 photographs. Um, this is a clear emphasis, and I was talking to a friend of mine who's a photo historian, and, and she observed that a lot of artists in the US in the 60s and 70s also focused on sort of subculture, if you will, the kind of what they saw as an interesting subset or subculture to um, American life. And here is a particular practice that was obviously familiar to many, yet relatively something that would not be spoken about, much less documented in uh, photographs. So he uses infrared film and a flash. Okay? So again, we have this almost random quality to uh, the scene. It's not necessarily set up for us. Um, um, the other thing is, is this a documentation? Is it, um, what, what, what kind of photograph is this actually? Is it, it doesn't really give us a lot of information about the practices, a kind of deliberate um, vagueness in terms of what we're seeing. And if we're getting to the kind of way that the aesthetic plays in, it's kind of like, if what, I mean the subject in a sense, the best part of it is this and maybe this, and the actual action over here is going on over here but we don't see anything. And I think in this case, what I found attractive about this is this kind of questioning or implying us in the scene, okay? That we become implicated as viewers. And so this artist seems to be questioning or challenging us to think about the nature of spectatorship, right? As viewers here, what are we? Are we neutral viewers or are we voyeurs? Are we, you know, do we take on that negative connotations that's associated with, um, for example, this? It's kind of a really fascinating social practice as well as um, artistic ideas here. So this runs in many ways counter to what we would expect of a normative society, right? Normative social behavior, this is definitely not supposed to be on the radar. And um, even today, we would find this not acceptable um, in, the, in normative social circles. So one of the projects in this case is to bring out into light that which is happening, but generally goes unremarked. Here again, this is um, Tomatsu from the Tokyo protest series. Um, this is uh, um, the uh, student protest against the Vietnam War, um, but also the renewal of a security pact with the United States. Um, this is a good example of this kind of um, you know, graphic kind of aesthetic that is being employed here for the uh, quality of the image to give us a sense of the energy of the individual, but we might you know, I think 1968 protest sort of clamps down meaning for us. It's like, oh, I see, this is post, this is an anti-war protest. But if we looked at just the image and we got rid of this, oops, yeah, we got rid of the back half here, right? And I just called this untitled. There is a sort of way that there's this kind of existential scream of the individual in the void of the universe, okay? That the individual is protesting, but against what? Right? And for what ends? And what purpose? And is this, is it, does it matter? Right? Kind of, kind of thought line, a line of thinking. So it provokes in, in my, as I look at it, a series of questions about human agency and what that agency is with respect to both the environment but also kind of the politics generated by other people. Kind of like a scream. Actually, it would be good to compare to the monk. The scream would work for this. Then we have a work like this, um, Tomatsu again. Um, this is a series he did in which he visited uh, communities that were um, part uh, or next to US military bases, calling this series uh, Chewing Gum and Chocolate. Again, we have this shot on this kind of, you know, on, this, on, on the, on the, what do I want to say, like 
instantaneously shot without kind of composure. He's almost as if he's glancing over us, right? But you get that gaze here that is about um, him looking at the photographer with a look, uh, I think, that we could read as potential disgust, um, distrust, um, certainly a power dynamic involved in this. And one of the things that these photographers were also interested in was exposing power in ordinary life. Okay? Rather than just thinking of it as like, oh, it travels top down, but seeing it in its more everyday fashion. And this the way the gaze of these two men kind of leer um, at us, um, putting us in many ways in the position of the photographer, but also of a Japanese person in relationship to a man in uniform who is empowered by a military apparatus that is in many ways um, you know, dominating um, Asian politics at the moment, and part of the Cold War as well. And we see his, but the same photographer in the same series. And here's why I think the series approach would be you know, to see them in a series matters, is that here you get to see the, um, the kind of, again, this grainy aesthetic. Okay, um, almost as if you know, he's clearly taken the picture so as not to get any detail um, into it. Uh, it looks like a B-52 bomber taking off, but it's like the photographer doesn't know what he's doing. Okay? If we're going to judge this by the standards of um, you know, an Ansel Adams type uh, photography, then this is not a good photograph. Okay. But the goal is to subvert our expectations for technical proficiency and to get us to move into some other realm of thinking about the relationship of, I guess, um, in this case, sort of the, 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 power, uh, the, the power of these, these aircraft, but also the kind of um, presence that they may have. Again, also the thing to keep in mind here is you can imagine these not printed up for a museum, but actually published in a magazine in the 1950s, in 1960s. 60s and 70s. So if you think back to magazine production qualities back in those, those days, good, but also not like you're going to be making a print of the highest quality. So in a way, they're interested in not being, um, in, they're interested in being graphic and not worrying that like, oh, well, this is all black and just completely you know, exposed to the point where you don't get any detail is a non-issue because it's going into a format where much of that detail might well be lost in the printing process. We also find, uh, for example, this um, uh, NATO uh, photographer who is doing a kind of street photography. But in this case, again, I think what I find of note here is this, the point of view that we're given. Okay? It's incredibly disorienting when we look at it at first. Are we looking up at the person or what? It sure seems like that at first, but then I think we realize he seems to be laying on the ground. Okay. So we get this, rather than a kind of Dorothea Lang documentation here, we get something that is much more disorienting and in the disorientation potentially more disturbing. Are we supposed to be in horror here or are we supposed to have sympathy? Okay. We're not really told here what to think. Okay. And it is, uh, I think, uh, that is what the photographer wanted. The photographer wants us to um, work with this um, rather than um, give us a clear answer. And I, I actually find this image quite um, settling, uh, unsettling, I should say, not settling. Okay. Here, uh, Takahira, number five from La Nui series, the night series. Um, again, we find this lack of evidence of the artist's craft, a sense of being done on the fly. Um, a kind of blurriness to it to give a suspense of uh, immediacy, as if seen from the corner of one's eye. And I think that's a good way to think about some of this uh, project. Um, and so undermines our notion that there is any unified artistic vision. What is artistic vision, according to the Provoke era ph photographers? Well, it surely isn't one in which the artist is sort of in command of the material. The artist is almost as if someone who circulates through the environment of people and places and randomly takes bits and pieces and re-presents them for us, but has no real mastery or control over the whole thing. The other thing I should say is that in this case, and also the other one here, Tomatsu's, is that this aesthetic distortions call attention to the objectness of the photograph. Rather than being something you just look through, you also end up looking at. Um, and they wanted to remind viewers that 
photographs were not windows onto another world, but rather something that was constructed and made, and therefore not some sort of fixed permanent truth. Here, um, Hoseos, Jose, 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 Man and Woman from 1960. I think this is like the popular one for the exhibit, the one shown most. Um, a deliberately unsettling composition, part of a series from Man and Woman, um, so numbered in this case, excuse me. Um, lack of clear narrativity, okay? a subversion of narrative content in order to make us sort of jolt us out of what would be perceived to be our ordinary, um, ordinary life. This same photographer actually worked with a dancer to create a photo book in 1969, um, 1000 limited edition. And the two visited, uh, here's, a, here's a photograph from the ex potentially from the exhibit. Um, here is where the, uh, the dancer actually um, uh, did a performance in this farming village. Um, it was an improvised performance inspired by the legend of a weasel-like demon named uh, Kamatachi. Um, and so here the photographer is actually documenting this as village participants um, unknowingly become part of the performance. So in this way, it's a hybrid. You have a dancer and a photographer, you have a sort of performance piece, and you have a final work of art, which is the documentation through the photographs. Um, so a kind of interesting, that's that hybridization I was talking about. Uh, and then just two more before we move on to um, a couple other ideas kind of to help situate this. Um, so here is um, Moriyama's Stray Dog from 1971, again, part of a series. Uh, really overexposed here, not finely nuanced in terms of its um, gray scale at all. Um, gives the dog this kind of potentially menacing quality, and yet we know it's a quite a small dog. So it has both menace and it's a stray, so we have sympathy. So it evokes a lot of kind of emotions in us, but without giving us any kind of direct um, kind of answer to how we should actually deal with them. Um, the dog was just simply taken randomly one morning as the photographer was en route to taking um, pictures outside, again, military bases. Um, and in some ways, this, one might say this is really ugly. Okay? I don't want to see this. This isn't something I want to be reminded of. I think that for these photographers, if, if they put together a body of work and someone said, oh, I don't want to see that, they probably thought that was the you know, greatest compliment you could give. Because in a way that that had challenged someone's um, kind of perceptions of what was right and wrong, I think they hoped ultimately that one would take those, per those challenges and sort of rethink them as the, the viewer go like, well, maybe I don't need to be so harsh on this. Maybe I should change my worldview. And that fits into a much kind of deeper idea about what the idea of art should be, okay? That this, this kind of political intended, art with political um, intention, even if not direct political content. And the last example, which seems to not quite fit, but was on the list, um, is Hiroshi Shujimoto's photograph photographs of, um, of movie theaters. Okay, so he is a photographer who comes of age kind of after this era, but he fits in the post, fits in the provoke era part. He comes in of age after the provoke magazine in the 1960s. Um, but we can unify him within this context as a result of idea-based art. Okay, so here is not so much the execution as the idea that is being represented. So what he does is he goes into a movie theater, he goes, in this case, he goes up to the, the balcony, sets up his camera, and the camera exposure lasts the full length of the movie. Okay, so what are we looking at? I think we're looking at a photograph of an entire film. Okay, do you see how this is a kind of idea about what film records, right? And recording time, and also maybe even referencing back to the history of photography in which early photography had very long exposure times, okay? So here is a photographer who's playing with ideas about cinema, film, both photography as film and cinema as film, and, and kind of engaging in a kind of clever kind of dialogue, okay? Um, you don't, of course, see the people or you don't see the film, but you conceptually know that it's there.
You can make of that as you will. Okay. All right. So here we are back to the series. So if we were going to like step back and see the exhibit as a whole now, one of the things I think we could say is that these photographers sought to define Japan and Japanese-ness in a more complicated and different way, rather than how it might be expected, have been expected, or how we might expect it. That is, they don't see a national essence. Okay? They don't see some kind of authenticity that could be attributed to Japanese people or Japanese culture. And one of the artists actually said that he saw Japan as a performative space, okay? Rather than thinking of it as, as, as uh, uh, thinking of the country as Japan as a place and where the people of Japan act as well as he also acted in that space. And therefore his job was to some degree to record parts of those actions, but because it's a giant performance, you could only ever get at small fragments. This makes a lot of sense if you consider that one of their aims is to get us to think about reality in a more complicated way. And that more complicated way would be in light of Expo 70, which I have to say I, I kind of heard of, but I never really looked at, which looks totally cool. But they did not think it was totally cool. I mean, and partly understandably so, if your goal was to sort of politicize your work and make it more about the complexities of lived life. Um, so basically, Expo 70 was a world fair. It was in Osaka. Um, its theme was progress and, I'm sorry, progress and harmony for mankind. Oh, as so, so, so world's fair theme type. It's a futuristic aerial city. Um, and for the Provoke era artists, many of them saw this as like, this is BS. Okay, this is sort of this packaged ideal of what the good life would look like if you could have the technology and the money to afford it. Okay? And so rather than focus on this, like, I mean, this isn't this like, you know, this is the multicultural ideal kind of thing. Um, and here we have the kind of juxtaposition. The other thing to keep in mind here, and so here's a photograph of this Tower of the Sun that was built, which still exists. Um, and the photographs of the site are, it's a really cool super neat kind of modernist, surrealist kind of um, site that is created. But the point I wanted to make is that, so here is the site. It's kind of this bringing together of all the people. What a happy family we humans are. It's 1970. It's the Cold War. It's the Vietnam War. You know, it's, there's plenty of reason to see that it's got a dark side. Okay. But, and inside the Tree of Life was this site-specific work called, um, yeah, inside the Tower of the Sun was a site-specific work, which I show you a photograph here, called Tree of Life. Okay? So I think that if we juxtapose these two, we can see that there's two very different versions of the world being represented here. Here is the one that has received official sanction by the government and the governments of the world, if you will. And here we have the artists who deliberately choose to be on the margins and saying, I'm going to be on the margins, so I'm going to show you the margins, because the margin in this raw, gritty fashion is much more truthful than the one that you're going to go to see here, which, you know, ironically, we might say, uh, well, let me go forward. Of the two, I'm standing here talking to you not about this, really, but about this. And so their kind of view of the world did have some longevity. OK, so the last one, the material, the Crocker collection. And, and I don't, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Um, I think, I think, I wouldn't kid you to tell you that. I think that this photo show, in some ways, poses challenges to how one might present it in the context of the collection. <laughs> Okay. I know your collection fairly well. Um, I came here to spend time with the collection before I, um, before I put this together. And I'm like, OK, so if I were going to do this, how would I do this? Right? Um, OK, so here's, uh, is that what I want? Oh, man, did I forget the? All right, well, let's, let's start here. OK, so I'm showing here, I forgot the slide numbers again, 42. But here's the Ernest Briggs from up in the Abstract Expressionist Gallery. I think on the one hand, you could simply go and do the kind of thing that these are First of all, you could do a historical point of view, that the Provoke era photographers rejected abstract expressionism. In fact, they rejected the kind of grand gesture that abstract expressionist painting is about. It's like, I'm going to make this painting, and it's going to be important, and it's going to be like in a museum, and 
the, the, the Japanese photographers are working you know, in photography. They're never interested in museums. They want magazines. Magazines widely disseminated. Um, so you could, you could do this. You could also do a kind of thing where they are, these artists are rejecting, uh, Japanese artists are rejecting abstract expressionism. Um, granted, they're photographers, so this is a kind of fuzzy comparison, but because they see this as representative of American power um, in a way that's sort of illuminated in this juxtaposition. Um, the other thing that we might say is that these artists, you know, wanted us to have a subjective experience in here, um, to, to read the painting and have an emotional response, whereas this artist wants us to sort of call into question our emotional response, or call into question our response, call into question what we see. Now, that said, what I think is interesting by this comparison is both of them challenge us to actually deal with these things, right? That there is a kind of rawness to the application of paint on the Briggs, and there's a kind of raw graphicness that I have a graphic quality that is characteristic of this photograph in particular. So even as there's difference, there is some commonality in this comparison. Let me go back. I think you could certainly say that the Herms Pandora's box is in line with the Provoke era photographs. Herms actually comes of age in the late 50s and 60s. I think he starts out as kind of like the, associating with the beat artists. Um, and he's certainly interested in bringing in the detritus of everyday life, the scraps, the junk, the stuff that you're going to throw out on the curb and making it into a work of art that has a kind of greater visceral response in us, generates a greater visceral response than, for example, oops, sorry, than, for example, the Briggs. You know, this is like, yeah, it's still a painting. It's supposed to have a response, but it doesn't really connect us to everyday life. I think Herms would certainly say, yeah, well, I'm going to make you something that's really going to connect to everyday life because it's the junk you're throwing out. And it has, it's sort of, he plays with this. Is this a painting or a sculpture or a collage or what is it, okay? It doesn't, he doesn't want to fit into nice, tidy categories in the same way that the Provoke era photo photographers did. So he asks us to question, what is art? What are artistic materials? Can we make something poetic and meaningful out of the scraps of real life as opposed to the, sorry, subjectivity of a single man? I mean, you know, one could argue that, in fact, you know, this, that is, the, the Herms is more real. And again, I think one thing it points out is sort of realism or reality is a relative term. Okay, you could also, I was thinking, well, we could do the kind of Volkus as well to bring this in, a kind of interest in um, the accidental. Okay, rather than interested in the finished, primed, kind of beautiful, crafted project. Oh, you have, you have this is, were you asking where it is? Yeah, it's up with the Bay Area figurative stuff. Yeah, it's on the end, sort of that middle wall that over here is the Briggs and over here is like Diebenkorn and stuff. Right, so, so we could, I think you could compare this to this and both, um, both, both rejecting a finish Okay, rejecting the idea that artist is going to be a craftsperson that is going to make something that A, is beautiful, but B, has a polish to it. Um, Volkus is really interested in sort of the, the, ran, the both form, but also the way that accident can play into the creation of, oops, sorry, in, in the cre creation of his finished work, right? Because clay has a particular male malleability to it, and he wants to exploit that rather than deny that. Um, in many ways, the Provoke era photographers are exploiting the kind of potential for overexposure um, or underexposure, which is really one of, the, if you want to say, like, Ensel Adams is kind of the anomaly. He's the guy who gets it, like, perfect, where everybody else who takes photographs generally over or underexposes. And so these are, again, both thinking about the materiality or the medium as a material rather than just thinking about the thing that they're going to picture or the thing that they're going to represent. I also thought, if we could bring this to um, this comparison, uh, slide 44, um, the Brian Tripp homeboys, and then again, the Takanashi um, uh, station photograph, is um, in this case, what I was thinking was who, the definition, the, the question of who defines who, okay? How, who defines, um, so Brian Tripp, 
is a Native American man, so who, who defines what Native American-ness is or Native American art should look like? Okay, there's the kind of, you type that in in Google, I'm sure a certain, what are those dream catcher things show up and other kind of Coca, Coca Pelli figures, right? I mean, and there's a sort of, that's the kind of genericness. And so here, I think what Tripp is doing is saying, look, I'm gonna draw on my own heritage, but I'm gonna picture myself and my culture in my way, in a way that is not going to necessarily conform to A, what you think art is, and B, what you think Native American is. Although at the same time, he might give us some kind of things that we do maybe expect. But he is the one who's asserting his authority as defining himself. And in the same way, I think that the Broke era photographers also sought to, um, uh, sought to define Japan and their cultural moment in their terms, rather than allow, say, the producers of Expo 70 to say, this is what we think um, Japan should look like. And I would also say that we could even fit this back to modernism, okay? Even though this is, um, you're probably like, this is completely crazy comparison. I always encourage you to make the craziest comparisons possible because you never know when interesting thoughts will come out of them, okay? So in some ways, this is a comparison because it's two landscapes, right? They're both landscapes. They're both trying to be modern or contemporary, I should say, with their period. They both attempt to rewrite the idea of landscape, okay? In many ways, this was taking, remember, landscape until Impressionism is very kind of finely painted. Impressionism takes the sketch, almost, and turns it into the finished work of art. Here, we have something of a landscape that's also sort of this kind of strange snapshot at night. Um, and so here, we almost have the snapshot aesthetic um, uh, elevated to the point of a kind of finished object. So both of them are revising the genre of painting, revising the genre of, um, of, of photography. Um, I was also thinking the way that both these are sort of um, exploring the nature of viewership, okay? Impressionism is predicated on a kind of understanding of vision, relate, vision translated into color and light, okay? So a scientific understanding of vision here um, in order to get a more real kind of representation, something that's more authentic, more truthful. Here, again, playing with this idea of voyeurism and how we relate to our subjects and the photographer as voyeur and photography as a voyeuristic experience. So questioning viewership and kind of relating both to kinds of uh, explorations of what it is to represent the act of seeing. Okay, so here representing the act of seeing. So there I'm at the end. So today I've tried to give you a sense of the kind of multiple contexts that you can see this provoke era photography. I think I guess if I'd offer one kind of important, like what's the take home lesson here? For me, the most useful lesson was to start to look at this material outside of its, specific, of its media specific context. If you read it only as like photography in the context of the history of photography, that's a totally useful and productive way to do it. But by moving this sort of like saying it, okay, how do I see this in relationship to other things going on in the art world at about the same time, you can start to make much, I think, more enlightening kind of um, connections that are there in terms of the big structuring ideas that these artists are dealing with rather than the purely kind of formal or the idiosyncratic things that they themselves say that they're working on. I mean, you know, artists are channeling, if you will, their cultural moment and their value system. And so these artists are not totally original, they're part of their moment thinking like other artists. So what are those other artists doing? What are these artists doing? And how do they share a kind of larger commitment to ultimately re representing that which they see as more authentic and more real, which is a kind of large project that many, many artists have dealt with. So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, field any questions.